Great, so good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here and obviously the easy task of talking about all the regulatory developments in the space, which isn't actually um, that easy. But I mean, there, there's so much going on around the world and I put up a very general sort of opening slide. Um, when people talk about the regulatory framework for cryptocurrencies, it's not actually purely just about regulation. I mean, the application of tax laws, anti-money anti laundering provisions, terrorist violence, etc. There are so many issues that are moving um, it's actually impossible to go back to sort of country by country um, analysis, really. So what I try to do is really simplify things in, in ultra simple terms. When we talk about you know, jurisdictional areas, focus being initially I said in Asia, I think back there, you know, initially, they allowed blockchain companies to operate without uh, restrictions. And um, it was only when they really started to explode that they became subject to more regulatory scrutiny. China was initially, I suppose, a refuge, um, then bans were introduced, exchanges there. Today, in their current form, uh, you know, really going on being tolerated. Um, South Korea, obviously, slightly different approach, blockchain technology, that's been very much encouraged, whilst um, domestic ICOs were, were completely banned. And Japan, being slightly different in being the first jurisdiction to recognize Bitcoin as a, as a, as a form of currency um, and introduce exchange. Uh, license regulation has been underwater. I think there are over 100 or so applications um, going on there at the moment. The, the US is actually um, quite different. I think there has been, it's been, I would say, overwhelming um, skepticism. And, and that, 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 to an extent, has prompted regulators to restrict potential mainstream uh, application of, of, of blockchain programs. Um, and that, you know, the, the, probably the most controversial discussions in the world are going on there at the moment about the future of the space, especially with regard to um, security-related uh, topics. So that's complex. Uh, Europe, obviously, is unique in that the law is effectively the same, if you like, at, at a very high level, but the interpretation is just completely different. So very simple topics of so what constitutes a transferable security, a form of derivative, e-money conversations, etc., etc. There are different interpretations. I think the best example of that is probably about a week ago, uh, where uh, the regional court of um, Berlin uh, decided that uh, Bitcoin trading in the general market didn't require a form of regulatory license. That was completely against the position of the regulator Baffin, probably around uh, 2011, which constitu constituted uh, Bitcoin as a form of unit of, of account, a financial instrument, which brought it within the scope of regulation. I'm giving that as one very simple and maybe silly example of already a divergence between the court system uh, on one side and regulatory system on the other not really agreeing on the interpretation of some um, simple um, areas. So, I mean, I, I think that, that's a very general overview. I think, for me, the interesting thing, when we talk about developments into 2019 and what's moving forward, I've tried to set out what I think, um, where this is going, um, and, and, and what I propose to do is really talk and, and focus um, on, on, on those areas. So again, the, the, the implication of the technology is, is, I think, generally speaking, deemed to be uh, relevant and, and necessary. That's a very high level uh, starting point uh, to make. And it's interesting, you've got groups like the World Economic Forum introducing systems for testing whether the application of the technology is regular, uh, relevant to a particular use case or not. Um, you know, the, the Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition, um, again, slightly different, but interesting that they're lo looking at the application of this, of this technology to security, personal security measures, security of information, freedom of, of, of speech provisions, um, voting mechanisms, moving from the 200-year-old democratic system into improving voting efficiencies, uh, philanthropy, increased transparency as a form of giving, tracing and tracking their, their donation systems, um, you know, all of this is uh, evolving, and I you know, pictured at the top the sort of you know, finger points there. The price moving up. Um, I mean, price moving up, making things more arguably uh, mainstream. That adoption uh, brings with it uh, attention. It brings with it scrutiny, media, uh, political bodies, mm -hmm. regulatory attention, etc. Um, and in some cases, that's good. Uh, policymakers are clearly looking at this now very, um, very closely. And I would high level say. There's probably been more development in the last six months than there has um, in, in the last uh, five years. 
but the question is how are policy makers actually um, looking at this uh, space? Uh, and I would say, you know, if we think again, go, go back a few years, go to, to 2013, it was, you know, FinCEN in, in the USA, we sort of recategorized virtual currency as a form of, 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 of money um, and brought it within the sort of money transmission or money service business rules um, out, out, in the, um, out in the US. And I think the focus of that was on a and &M. I mean, clearly the initial focus point in, in, in 2013 was a and um, KYC. And I, I suppose back then it was deemed that that was probably sufficient to deal with the main risks uh, of, of the industry. Um, so th I think the, the thinking at that point was you know, the virtual currency ecosystem, if you like, you know, wouldn't really be sustainable for that long. It wouldn't be sustainable for that long without the fiat um, interaction. It wouldn't really be uh, a threat. And I, I suppose up to about a year ago, that was to a degree a form of uh, status quo. But the rise and the development of these protocols, the development of the technology, etc., cetera, has, has, uh, has changed that to the point now where there's so much more focus on, on other relevant issues related to consumer protection, related to governance requirements relating to the appropriate compliance frameworks that are built around these uh, businesses. So there's clearly you know, a huge amount of positive development in the space as to the application and, and use. Um, and at the same time, you know, beyond the hype, I've talked about some of the, the negatives, which sometimes you know, aren't really talked about that much, um, to be honest. So when I say, uh, who, who controls this market? Um, you know, what are the drivers of price and movement and liquidity in the space at the moment? Is it a question of irrationality? Is it irrational exuberance that's the, 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 the driver of this? Is it um, illicit uh, demand? I mean, it's, that's not something I particularly agree with, but certainly there are arguments around that. Is it uh, simple crypto winnings? Is it groups of people that were in the space 10 years ago that have made huge amounts of money that are driving themselves into the new developing um, spaces? Or is it smart money? Is it really people who understand, see the opportunities? Is it the classic VC firms and hedge funds and family offices, etc., taking uh, positions in, in these uh, new markets? But the reality, the reality is that no one uh, is one hundred percent sure. Um, so that that is something that you know continues to draw uh, attention, certainly uh, around around the world. The second point I made, which is another interesting one. Um, another one, another one that's actually not often um, discussed, really. So I talk about um, paper disclosure and consistency with with smart contract code. So if if we agree that the key form of software known as let's just use the term smart contracts, it automated you know, if this uh, then that rules that coders uh, can design to give sort of functionality to digital uh, crypto assets, let's say sold in ICOs, etc. Um, but that's very interesting. At the same time, I see I think quite a lot to teach us about the uneasy uh, relationship between law um, and, and technology. So, in, in our in our in our present moment, I mean, one one basic question around new financial contracting around these smart contract mechanisms is is pretty simple. How are how are investors uh, protected from um, exploitation? So. Clearly, the code has the potential to become a, a substitute for and to complement legal governance and financial contracting, etc. But does does the potential transform it into um, a reality? So, what's the relationship between the paper promises made in a white paper and the actual uh, tech, tech functionality of the, uh, of, of, of the of the tokens that are being uh, generated? So, I've been involved with various groups, and there's been lots of interesting work done in the space, looking at the sort of audit gap uh, between what ICS promised and their code delivers, and that, that can be quite a wide uh, gap. So there are, if you like, three main elements um, of governance that, that uh, ICO backers, I suppose you would say, uh, can be a claim can be delivered through uh, code, and which should be salient and, and relevant to, to investors in the space. The first is, you know, did the promoter make any promises and encode those assurances to restrict supply within within uh, the, the tokens that are being issued. The second is, did ICO pro promoters pledge and, and codify uh, restriction around the transfer of crypto assets allocated to particular people, so vesting schedules and lock-in provisions, etc., 
lots of people talk about those vesting schedules, etc., in open white paper documents. But look at the audit uh, analysis and output of whether that is actually codified into the smart contract, and there's a bit of a, a, a gap um, quite often there as well. The third point is, did the, did the promoter retain the power to actually modify uh, the smart contract? Um, so governing the actual tokens that are being generated. Uh, and if they did retain that, very, very powerful, um, was, was that um, disclosed? So the reality, when I talk about evolution and the sort of world, how it looks at this, how investors look at this, etc., cetera, um, the reality is that they don't often match, and that, that is something that I expect to be um, a focus point, especially in the financial mm -hmm. ecosystem, which is you know, built around the proposition that regulation is unnecessary because uh, code is the final guarantee of performance. So the absence of, let's call it, you know, code of governance protection, that can be a little bit uh, concerning. And the reality as well, we all know people don't read smart contracts. I and mean, I certainly don't have the capability or capacity to, to do that. So why are people, or who is buying these tokens and, and why are they, are, they, are they buying them? So those are high level points. I'm saying when we talk about disclosure differences, um, white paper and prospectus act type uh, approaches, there are lots of different approaches and I see over time a sort of closer matching of those principles and the information. I mean, investor warnings uh, are quite simple, all, all white papers will have uh, lots and lots of investor warnings, but what about the risks to you know, other stakeholders, uh, the risks to the actual company itself, to the advisors, to the actual tokens or shares themselves, that, that's, a, that's a separate point. And also as a, as a final piece, because you know, we often hear the, the approach of the decentralized universe changing with everything, um, it, it's interesting, one of the recent reports that, that, that I read, see that actually of all crypto assets in circulation, categorizing them one, one by one, only 16% only uh, really amounts to uh, decentralized platforms. But that's not to say um, that, you know, that won't change or can't change, and I do often use this Interesting, probably some of you have probably seen it before, but um, you know this was 1995 in a you know, Silicon Valley tech author commenting on the future of the of the of the internet uh, at the time, and he thought it was all baloney. Uh, the truth: no online database will replace your daily newspaper. No CD-ROM can take the place of a competent teacher, and no computer network will change the way that. Uh, that spectacular uh, misstatements in, in, in 1995 about the internet. I'm only making that point to show that you know this, this, this is an evolving space and an evolving system and I, and I certainly expect that to um, continue to, to happen. So if I touch on sort of what I think are going to be uh, the, the, the regulatory hard points or focus points moving forward, um, certainly the move to regulate and provide transparency around uh, crypto exchanges, how they operate and how they work, that, that is a huge um, focus point. Um, I, I would say beyond the securities and how we test and all of that being a primary focus, I, I would see this as really being the, the primary um, focus. And we can already see most of the largest exchanges, most exchanges pursuing this in, in different ways, trying to bring themselves within um, the scope of, 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 of regulation. But you know, clearly the focus points for all of the jurisdictions that evolve are, are slightly different. But I think that absolutely market manipulation is uh, market abuse, or no market abuse act or equivalent provisions to what exists in the market abuse act, etc., mm -hmm. that apply to these uh, markets. And, and not just the actual market manipulation, but all the operation around market makers in the space, buyback mechanisms, uh, distribution voting mechanisms. I mean, there, there are all sorts of uh, points that need to be considered from a consumer protection perspective. Um, and and my, my own approach with all of this, what I hope can happen, and certainly what will happen um, in, in Gibraltar, is that we're not going to just simply apply existing regimes in their entirety, and, you know, tests that already exist in a suitability, suitability universe designed many, many years ago for very different uh, types of uh, businesses, apply those in full to these new um, these new technologies and services and platforms that, that, that are really quite quite different. Um, but I do feel that there's going to be a continuing uh, de developing um, investor protection focus. 
and, and there, there are lots of there are lots of reasons why that. I'm, I'm citing here um, a coin firm uh, risk report that was generated on exchanges um, specifically. And I think risk assessments are always interesting when they're conducted sort of independently by groups like uh, like coin firm. Uh, and interesting to see that of the 40 or so, 30, yeah, 40 or so um, exchanges that were assessed, um, you know, they they they're risk categorised. Um, the licensed and authorised uh, exchanges only constituted eight of, of what was assessed uh, completely. When we when, when they, they use the term licensed and authorised, um, the, the, the focus point there is um, that they meet minimum standards. So senior management team aren't fit and proper, there are appropriate frameworks of systems and controls for you know, um, managing and mitigating specific risks that are relevant to an exchange, uh, customer due diligence verification, custody, cyber security, capital adequacy, uh, relevant arrangements being, being in place. And, and also, you know, the other points, I'm going to do them one by one, but very simple things like sanctions. You know, Non-compliance non with sanctions is a, is a, is a criminal offence in most jurisdictions. And when exchanges are required to um, to comply and have in place policies and procedures to manage and mitigate that risk, and that's not something new. That was something developed by the United Nations Security Council under Chapter Seven of the, the UN Charter a long time ago. So the, the interesting thing about seeing some of the breakdowns is is the kind of follow through to see what at the moment is constituting what. So again, this is from the same coin firm. Uh, report, but in terms of that low risk license and authorized institutions, they account for, you know, let's call it $33 billion worth of transactions, whilst the high risk unregulated space currently or, you know, accounts for $367 billion. So you can see where the market is today, but I think where it's going is also becoming uh, more and more obvious. Uh, and similarly, uh, on the DD uh, or KYC uh, perspective, Again, um, on, on the low risk, this, this accounts for a relatively low percentage of the actual activity that's been conducted in the space at the moment as well. So again, I, I do, if the topic is future developments, I see that development continuing to evolve and, and, and that, that is all becoming more and more um, obvious. So, I mean, I think talking high level about AML, KYC, CFT, etc., that's clearly uh, a very strong uh, focus point. Going back to things like ICOs only a year or 18 months ago or two years ago, there were discussions as to whether this even applied to something like uh, an ICO. Uh, and the groups, I mean, certainly in Gibraltar, we had very specific amendments to our law to specifically capture this. There are still questions of interpretation. In some uh, jurisdictions, they only apply to certain types of tokens categorized in a certain way and not to others, so um, it's, it's all slightly different, but what I wanted to highlight here really is um, yeah, the FATF recommendations. These are originally, I think, from around 2015, um, and they were amended actually uh, about a week ago, or, yeah, about a week ago, um, and the FATF recommendations back then were for countries to register license entities providing um, exchange services um, and identify and, and, uh, and assess uh, an LTF risk, etc. That, that is very clearly um, what um, one of the purposes of developing a regulatory framework specifically for the space is exactly what we've, um, what we've done in Gibraltar. So to that extent, I think we're well, well ahead uh, of the, the curve and uh, introducing those recommendations and having them in law already <coughs> is quite significant. Um, similarly, when people talk about MLD5, the new anti-money laundering directive scheduled to, uh, I think, take effect um, in, in, on January uh, 2020. Um, I think most people know that it's been designed for the first time to capture specific uh, custody wallet providers and, uh, and exchanges and make them uh, obliged entities un under the law, so that the provisions of the new MLD uh, directive will, will apply in full. And again, for, from our point of view, um, regulating a business that operates or uses distributed ledger technology for a transfer of storage of value mechanism is actually much wider than what is caught under AMLD5. So in Gibraltar, the framework is already much wider and already brings all of those um, 
all of those businesses within the scope of exactly those provisions. So um, I, I expect that to continue to develop and, and, uh, and we've seen different jurisdictions making different um, efforts on, on, that, on that side of things as well. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, very, high, very high level. We touch on the, the upper requirements equivalent to the you know, UK process requirement, uh, etc. But the, talking about the nine regulatory principles, I, I don't really want to get into detail about the Gibraltar um, specific um, regime, but the, the key point for us is not trying to merge um, new technology and business mm -hmm. into old regimes and try to apply them. But what we've tried to do is from the ground up build out a purpose-built regime that deals specifically with the items of risk, etc., that are relevant to this new and developing industry. And that is exactly um, why we've done what we've done, and why we've brought within the scope of regulation these these new um, these new these new businesses. Taking advantage of new um, technology and new solutions is also something that people don't really uh, spend that much time um, looking at or understanding. So some people still, you know, going back, and, uh, maybe people as they think, oh, this is all just possibly anonymous and like just don't understand everything, and this is all uh, a nightmare. I mean, taking advantage of the you know, corner firms, the elliptics, uh, the channel analysis, etc., uh, technology and the processes that can be run through uh, for these exchanges, the transaction monitoring, uh, the onboarding processes for you know assessing the history of any contribution or interaction with that exchange. Is incredibly uh, complex and, and interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely see that as on, an ongoing focus point for many, many businesses um, in, in the space. And this just highlighted again some, um, some, some, some of the guidance that was issued by our regulators specifically in respect of these requirements, traceability provisions, etc., that already apply to businesses that, that are regulated. So other than uh, the obvious uh, AML KYC provisions, again, there are lots of reports. People all often bring up the risk of hacking and uh, customers losing money and it's all uh, very risky, etc. cetera. Um, from, from our perspective, that's slightly, um, slightly different in that we already have um, insurance provisions in place, requirements around capital advocacy, around security, around safeguarding, segregation, around custody arrangements. Um, the, these are already requirements law. So when we read an FCA report saying that a proportion of safeguards to do, deliver um, resilience, etc., should be brought in, uh, that is effectively what we feel we've already done. Um, and also building something out that is balanced, and, but also provides adequate protection for consumers um, in the UK Treasury report, that, that is absolutely um, something that we, we feel already. But I think the custody uh, focus points are gonna continue to develop. Um, we work with some groups that had very specific proof of control audits and internal audit uh, control, um, independent audit mechanisms that are taking place on an almost weekly uh, basis that are um, incredibly complex. We also are already seeing the fidelities, I think they announced mm -hmm. recently some of their own client custody solutions that have been developed. I think Swiss Group the day before yesterday announced the same thing. Um, those are new world technologies. Uh, from the old world, the Bitcoins and the Zappos uh, um, of the world, very specialist solutions. So I, I, I do expect those the, 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 the markets, as, as the markets for cryptocurrencies and other digital assets uh, mature, so, so will those um, custody um, standards. And those custodians and auditors, etc., will become um, trusted parties that um, comprise the right infrastructure for reliable uh, custody arrangements. And again, these are just again some of our, our guidance and it's around systems and control and safeguard and segregation that are already um, requirements for businesses that are operating out of uh, out of Gibraltar. Um, um, again, I won't go into too much detail. I don't want to make it a complete sort of Gibraltar uh, pitch, but uh, I thought I'd mention CoinFloor, who are um, one of the first uh, the first company to obtain a DLT license in Gibraltar, a London-based, I think the oldest exchange based in. In, in London, and the reason I'm just bringing this up is um, the, 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 the the recent uh, Treasury Committee meeting at the uh, House of Commons here. Um, Obi, who was the CEO of Common Floor, you know, was was asked these questions, and it was great to see um, him comment that you know the, they how impressed they've been with, with the approach. 
and the fact that we are taking these specific uh, policies, CFT provisions, policies around custodianship, all of these things are already matters that we've brought into, uh, into effect. Um, and obviously it's great to have that um, recorder of those, of those uh, bright levels. So that, that, you know, I've talked a bit about custody, a bit about uh, the ML universe uh, that is evolving and the exchange risks that are also developing. Um, I thought, you know, I mean, security tokens and the security token universe is definitely a huge uh, focus point at the moment there. I think everyone will, will know that. Uh, I think the starting point has been, well, well, you know, ICOs have gathered momentum, done what they've done, etc. Um, people have wanted to bring this within the security uh, universe for different reasons. Um, lots of lots of complexities around that, which I, I, I won't go into. But I also think that two people do get a little bit um, a little bit lost. Um, I mean, I think the attraction for sometimes tokenized assets or tokenized securities or tokens in general has been the attraction to um, liquidity and liquidity in this market. Um, doesn't doesn't really um, it doesn't really exist yet. Um, clearly, there's a huge demand, uh, and a very obvious demand to bring more efficient systems um, into place to move away from the ancient sort of T plus three settlement timeframes, etc. Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure. I'm not 100 percent sure that you know, law or technology is going to transform uh, an illiquid asset into. Uh, a, a liquid one, and that, that, that's something that needs to be uh, brought in mind. But I do expect this to continue to evolve, and there's some you know, super initiatives in place uh, at the moment. One of the most well known is the one being run by the Gibraltar uh, Stock Exchange, I'm sure you heard from um, later on, and that's a very exciting uh, and unique uh, approach. And there are others like Open Finance, and Tizio, etc. But the, the, the point is that when people talk about security tokens, I think there's a huge focus on the sale or the issuance of the uh, token. People sometimes assume that that is the legal or regulatory touch point for anything that's uh, security related. Um, the reality is that you know the exchange mechanisms that provide or can provide that liquidity that sit around, how those interact with the MTF universe and other exchange, exchange related um, regulations is not that um, it is not that simple, um, and you know there are groups of lawyers and other groups from from the U.S. who feel that if there are tokens that have certain types of uses that may fall arguably within the definition of a security, certainly in, in the U.S., uh, that, that even if there are platforms that are permitted for secondary market trading and sales, there are pieces of uh, federal securities. Or that will, will restrict that from actually working properly in practice. So I expect that to be an evolving, uh, a definite evolving area. But what, what I wanted to also say, I, I mentioned very, very briefly the sale, the focus on the issuance rather than the trading. People also, I think, sometimes forget that um, when, when you talk about a security token and you think that the only regulation sits around its sale and promotion, you know, we are in the classic. Um, equity or securities uh, universe. It's not just the selling activity that can bring you within the regulator space. We're talking about promotional activity, we're talking about the arrangement of transactions, we're talking about advisory services, we're talking about brokerage arrangements, we're talking about market making facilities. Um, there, there are lots of things that, that need to be considered. I'm flagging that because we get so many requests from the groups that say, oh, we want to do a security token sale, it's an ERC-20, a security token that's going to be freely transferable around the world, and you've got a website and you can sell it all. And that just doesn't work. So once you, and people in the Ethereum network have, have, have uh, moved from the RC20 to 71, and more recently 1440, and all of that to, to try to bring in the specific requirements. But this is all development. This is all um, work in, in progress. I don't think it's something where there's uh, an immediate um, working uh, solution today. Um, the, the other point, uh, I mean, there are lots of other new markets outside of the MTF rules. Uh, there's the new SME uh, growth market regime. Outside of the prospectus, we have this concept of this growth prospectus, uh, with, with, which has 
proportion of disclosure regimes built in. So that's very interesting for the space, and, and there are lots of groups that are uh, looking at that as well. So I mean, I think this is a, it's very exciting. I mean, it's a very, very unique, very exciting, and absolutely there's a huge opportunity there. But sometimes people need to take a slight step back and understand some of the other points that need to be um, considered in, in the same in the same group. So where else do I um, think that? There's likely to be development. I won't go uh, over the same point that, that Dr. Wolf and, and, and there's been lots of comments on, on that as well. Certainly, there's a huge um, uh, movement in, in that space. I think there are, there are around 23 live projects at the moment, but I think about 57 that are um, in, in development. And it's true that there are probably two main stability mechanisms at the, at the moment. One is effectively asset backed, let's call it the USD backing, um, and other sort of algorithmic. Uh, Approaches, but the focus on that, the focus on the infrastructure and foundational layer for uh, crypto assets, it's felt um, could lead to uh, a much wider uh, adoption and actually a much greater uh, competition, if you like, for fiat currencies and, 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 and what they do. Um, so I, I absolutely think that that's going to continue to, to be a focus point. Maybe something as simple as a you know, smart contract insurance scheme where the settlement is in a stable coin makes that incredibly attractive. Whilst if the settlement is in the form of Ether or uh, Bitcoin or whatever, you, you're exposed to that volatility, which isn't particularly relevant for something like an insurance contract. So that, that's uh, one potential you know, of the main use cases. And then on the on the on the protocol layer, uh, that's I mean, we've already mentioned uh, EOS and Neo, Cardano, all these guys. There are groups like uh, RSK who, who I uh, know well, and there are very, very exciting uh, developments on, on that side of um, things as well. I mean, RSK is slightly different in that it is attached to the Bitcoin universe and has this sort of two-way pack paid to, um, to the Bitcoin uh, blockchain, but it addresses scalability issues slightly differently in the sort of sidechain. A model allowing, it's not 300,000, but it, up to 100 transactions a second, which brings it um, brings it within the PayPal equivalent, if you like, um, regime. And there are lots of other uh, points that are interesting in, in respect of RSK and other groups in the space. But I, I, I'm making these points very, very high level just to say, again, smart co the, the stablecoin initiatives, absolutely a focus point. The protocol layer development, absolutely a focus point. Um, and I think that they're going to help continue to, to provide um, solutions to to, to the issues that this industry is always trying to target and address. So I think that is everything, I think, from me. Um, in brief summary, yes, uh, there are changes coming through, there are challenges, uh, but there are also opportunities that I think will, will um, continue to emerge. I do think that proportionality and appropriate regimes are, are, are the key uh, point. I think it's more complex than simply moving everything into the old world of regulation. Law, and I don't expect a globalization of, uh, of standards. Um, our framework, I mean, I'm making the point that it's already incorporated just because we hear about so many jurisdictions that are now doing this or about to do it or whatever. It's been a long process to get to the position that we're, we're in today, um, and, uh, and also very, very exciting. Um, so that, that is, I think, everything for me. I hope that's been uh, interesting, and I'll pass back over to me. And I think actually, Difficult questions, I'm glad we made sure.